Hello, everyone. Um, I think this is the first time in history of Dors Clark that we are actually early on schedule, not latest on schedule, as far as I remember. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's good to see many familiar uh, faces. <laughs> it's good that we are in person again. Uh, I will talk about shifting life security with FLOSS. Uh, that means, in, in short, uh, if you don't know me, uh, I'm actually employed by Diverto, uh, which is like information and cybersecurity oriented company. And the most important part is we are hiring, of course. <laughs> so if you're looking to, if you are, for example, DevOps or uh, let's say Linux system administrator looking to shift into security space, ping me, ping Luca, he's also here. Uh, Luca, raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, so, or you can just go here to the website and see. Uh, yeah, we are looking for multiple roles, so feel free to, to jump in. Uh, I'm CTO there, so also ask me after everything about what, whatever you are interested in about the company. And also, uh, my focus area, if if I can just say in two sentences, is actually information security and, of course, free software. Uh, if you don't believe in anything like experience and that stuff, have multiple certificates. Here's just some of, some of them here. So, yeah, let's let's go to some more interesting stuff. Is of course uh, shift left, right? Uh, it's all those modern words, three letters words, and so on. I will talk about, talk about mostly is about DAS, SAS, the tools integration, questions, and so on. So I guess you know what means shift left. If not, uh, it's coined by Larry Smith in 2001 that testing should be done earlier, and also uh, the security should be done earlier in the process, right? I guess you know that already, and it is really quite important step uh, towards better security in organization and, and wider. Uh, why? Well, if you see, uh, since it's been like uh, two or three years before the last conference was here, I guess we can take a, a look back what happened and one of most interesting things in security what happened like a few years back is that uh, we had a interesting supply chain problem, supply chain security problem where one company ha has compromised its build tools and it shipped all those compromised tools to its customers. So they had like 80,000, 18,000 customers affected with this vulnerability. And it's quite interesting because nobody could detect it. Uh, the only one who actually detected that something is happening is actually a security company called FireEye. Uh, they actually detected and said they didn't detect it very early. They actually detected later once they had like 300 tools there, tools stolen. So it's uh, security tools, their internal security tools for red team testing, all, all kind of security tools which shouldn't be public, immediately, be, let's say, leaked to some of the threat actors. Uh, it's interesting because Microsoft also said the only reason we know about this thing happened is that FireEye told us. It's all, all begin with, with their like disclosure, hey, it's happened to us. See, see if, uh, let's see if, if you are affected as well. And then a lot of companies started popping out and said, hey, we have also this one. We are also compromised. We are also compromised and so on and so on and so on. So it was really interesting adventure uh, regarding this. It's actually interesting because their build tools were compromised. Uh, so everybody who were using their tools 
it, it is about solar winds, right, had this problem. Another thing which is interesting is uh, usually people say, oh, don't, don't say that we have an incident because something bad will happen. Firewire said it earlier, and you will see how once they said their stock prices went up. Uh, that's an interesting thing, not down. And the other interesting thing is that uh, solar winds who didn't know about this thing, uh, I don't think anybody wants to use the, their software anymore because they didn't notice it. That's also interesting. So talking about incident is actually quite good and as you can see, it's helpful to, to anyone because the other ones knows that they are actually compromised. <coughs> so uh, let's say that White House advisor said let's, it's like 100 companies were really affected. Uh, they had been compromised. And the other ones, uh, which SolarWinds reported, it's around 80,000 people. Why I'm talking about this one, it's one of the good examples and this uh, problem started rolling out the other solutions, how we can actually approach to it. The other thing, I guess, you can remember this disaster as well. Uh, it, it was still until, until COVID-wide problems. We had a log4j problem, uh, which was uh, quite interesting because log4j was uh, embedded into most Java software which needs to log something and there is a lot of software <laughs> which logs something. And uh, yeah, all advisors alerts started popping out uh, everywhere. And uh, this one is really good free software example, open source example. Uh, how once you embed the open source component, uh, it can really become this disaster if you don't pay attention. Right to details. Uh, another thing is it's quite interesting is there was like a lot of alerts from uh, really uh, a lot of different government bodies, security organizations, security companies, and so on. One of the example is about CSA, which is Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. We also, uh, as a developer, released a tool which is uh, NumUp uh, scripts to check for these ones, NSCs, which is also web featured by those agencies. And it was really, when you see such alerts, that means usually security people doesn't sleep. Uh, they try to identify all vulnerable software and then try to fix that vulnerable software, right? And identifying where all log4j can be, it's pretty tedious task. If you were ever uh, try to do it uh, on such a large scale on your organization, if you have large organization, it was really, really challenging task to do. And again, also to, to fix. As the fixes were coming, oh, this fix is not good, this can be bypassed, and so on and so on, there was like a few more uh, <clears throat> releases and I guess you can remember that pain. I see someone also going out so that means they don't want to remember again. <laughs> so yeah, it was really challenging time. Uh, and if you see uh, open source is really one of the supply chains, right, I into almost every software today. And uh, the attackers actually are targeting what is the most weak point, right? If you have the weakest link, okay, let's target this one. And there are a lot of research done, what, what's, what's have been done, and these four are usually the most common targets right now to actually target uh, attackers which try to target. First, they try to target organization, but if it doesn't happen, let's see their supply chain who they use, what software they use, and so on. Let's attack them, and then through this software, we will attack the real target, right? And the real targets are actually source code, build systems, CI CD tools, and code testing tools. This is the most common target ones. And what else they do? They try to do like typo squatting, so they actually serve like 
domain which looks very simil similar, or you will just uh, mistype some letter and get the uh, wrong package name or wrong um, <coughs> tool and so on. And also, they try to put malicious code inside by some pull request or any, uh, let's say, repository uh, compromise. And also there is a cases with, with, with tool tempering. If anybody remembers like Kotko incident, where they actually uh, could <coughs> inject also interesting stuff. And there is some kind of uh, research also done, and they say like 64% of companies were, organizations were affected uh, by some kind of these problems. So it's really a big problem, right? And of course, uh, the solution, I know you already know this one is actually, let's, let's start to build it from, from scratch. Let's uh, make that uh, everyone is accountable for security and so on and so on. Uh, and let's do it as much as possible automatically, right? Uh, and of course, let's just if everybody is using CI/CD, let's just embed security into CI/CD. That's something normal, something perfect, perfectly normal and perfectly fit to put one, right? I know uh, there are people who doesn't like that cloud stuff. They usually prefer on-site, but for on-site, yeah. Uh, anybody using drone as a CI/CD? Okay. Well, I can give you. My example, anybody using Jenkins? Okay, we have more Jenkins people, okay. Uh, drone is something that is good, for example, very lightweight pipelines. It's, it's quite good for, uh, let's say, Soho use. But I guess most of you are using more enterprise one. Of course, uh, the idea is let's put security into continuous integration and let's all those Three letter acronyms, let's uh, do it side by side, what, what can be done, right? Uh, first thing, of course, is let's do static ap application analysis, right? Let's see how, how we actually write the source code. Uh, these tools actually analyze the source code. Since it's free software, we can actually do the source code analysis, and also if you are doing closed source, if you have access to the source code, we can do it, right? Uh, the mostly problems, uh, the, the most common approach with SAS tools is that they are looking at the input and things. So that means let's see where data comes from and let's see where it ends. If it ends somewhere where it's not good and the input is not trusted and we are not doing anything about it, it's vulnerability. So let's say if it goes from uh, some kind of browser input and it goes back to the database, okay, it's equal injection. If it goes down to, I don't know, any LDAP or whatever, it's LDAP injection or common injection or whatever. Or if it goes from the browser, again, back to the browser, it can be like cross-site scripting, right? So, <coughs> it's most common one and the, the back actually good start to actually implement CI-CD to look at the source code. The other thing is, uh, let's run the application and see how we can detect vulnerabilities as well. If it's web application, that means let's crawl the, uh, the application what all those inputs are and let's put a lot of stuff inside which, is, which can cause some kind of security problem to the application. Uh, there are like, of course, free ones and the commercial ones. Uh, and uh, I will just mention a few of them which can help you. These are actually two most common ones in, in the past, right? But there is another thing which is right now, let's say, popular is interactive application security testing. Interactive security te testing is that you actually dynamically hook the functions which is input and you know the access to the source code and you can actually look where it ends. So you can actually embed from, <coughs> uh, let's say you can actually embed going from directly from uh, what, what goes to the input 
and what goes to the, to the sync, but you can also embed it into your current functional testing. And the other thing which is quite good is you can actually say where the, where the, the problem is. Uh, in dynamic testing, you don't know in the source code where the problem is if you don't have good like troubleshooting and uh, <coughs> code guru uh, techniques, right? Uh, the other problem with dust limitation, if you ever try to implement it inside CD, is that it takes time. And usually people don't like putting it as a CI CD pipe because the problem is uh, you have to, let's say if it's web application, you have to crawl all the inputs, find all the inputs, you have to uh, feed it with, let's say, invalid input, which is some kind of security related. And there is like a lot of problems if you have two-factor authentications, you have to modify the application and so on and so on. Uh, the problem is uh, dynamic testing actually finds a lot of vulnerabilities which static doesn't find. So what I usually prefer is actually have it done it, for example, by night, uh, like in nightly builds or something like this, because then I have more time to actually see uh, the problems. And uh, to run, actually, and see the problems on the end. Uh, the problem with static analysis is actually there is no good open source one where you can actually look at the source code and that it tells you the problems there. The only, let's say, exception is SEMgrep, which is kind of useful, but it's still like regular expression based mostly. Uh, mostly uh, they actually detect the flows, okay, but you have the problem if you have to connect the flows from different modules and so on. This is what even commercial ones have problems. And of course, uh, there are a large number of false positives. Even they, they have come up to with idea, let's say, oh, let's make uh, machine learning to actually remove false positives, right? The problem is, uh, if you just look at the source code, uh, you don't understand the context. Even, even if you look manually at, at the source code and if you don't look at the application, how it looks like, you have a hard time analyzing the source code. I know if you ever tried to do that. It's quite hard. So it's actually quite good to actually look at the source code and having the application uh, running somewhere. <clears throat> and the other problem with, with SAST is analysis can take time. The, even when, when you try to analyze the source code, it takes time, and even once you do it manually, it takes time. And uh, you can speed it up with incremental stuff, incremental scanning, differential scan, and so on. It takes time, right? With the Dust integration, it's quite good. I, even you, you can do it with on, on the GitHub and so on. I know, guys, you you you, you hate GitHub, but you ha you can actually implement those two technologies very easily, right? Dust and Dust. But uh, the other problem is how I know uh, what kind of components I have in my application. This is the problem which is a general security problem for all applications, not just the free ones, also the closed ones. And uh, <coughs> since uh, these things happened with SolarWinds and so on, uh, there was like a president executive order, US president executive order, where he actually said, okay, this is the things we will do to actually increase the security in general, cybersecurity in general. And one of the things is actually, let's make a software bill of materials. Let's see all the components which make up of these applications. So we actually know what components we have in applications, so we will know if something is vulnerable, we can actually remediate, mitigate that problem. <coughs> and actually, things happen quite fast. Since that pres president executive order, we actually had uh, like uh, already defined minimum uh, elements which for software build ma of materials must have. And we have the standard for actually defining 
uh, so we can actually l uh, see it, we can actually interpret it by machine, right? So that's why we have a software package data exchange. And this is actually quite good standard, which can actually explain all the components which you have to describe, you, your software have, and uh, so that any other tool can understand. This is actually quite good because then if you produce something like this, uh, ev every other tool, security related or not, can tell you if something is vulnerable or not. The other thing is, uh, which I will not mention later because uh, it's not so security related, but you also have like a licenses and copyrights, right? There is a like long story of licenses and copyrights and you probably know better than me. Where actually, uh, <clears throat> if you have some kind of uh, legal problems between two licenses, you, you will have your project very in very terrible state then because they are incompatible. Un so this is actually quite good to, to see from the security risks, but also from the legal risk of, of your licenses. And uh, <clears throat> it's actually moving in, in, in the right direction so everybody could produce something like this for their software, right? Even for the uh, uh, free software or closed one, right? And that actually means, uh, I think even it will be easier than to enforce some of the licenses like GPL for someone who is not uh, conforming to the GPL stuff because they have to list all those software which they are use. And this actually is called software composition, let's say analysis in, in security terms. And one of the most popular is this, uh, like uh, OS dependency check. So that means if you, if you run it, it will tell you all the components it had identified and also the vulnerabilities you have inside the software. So for example, if you use Node, it will look at the package JSON. If you use, I don't know, uh, Golang, it will go look at your Go modules or whatever uh, language you use. The most popular ones, of course, the Java ones as well. So yeah, it will tell you if you have problems with Log4j, for example. <laughs> So uh, the most interesting thing is uh, it has a low number of false positives because it will identify the components. Only if you're not using that functionality, maybe then you have false positive because uh, you're not using that one, it's vulnerable, but once you start using that functionality of that component, you have the problem, right? And the check, check is actually quite fast, right? Comparing to dynamic analysis, you are done in a few minutes, right? And it's really suitable for CICD, and I highly encourage you to actually implement it. <coughs> uh, this one is another example of cloud integration, but it's uh, uh, not important. So since you are mostly using Jenkins, this is one of the, one of the examples we have. Uh, it's really small example. Uh, how it can be implemented is we, we can actually have like, uh, let's say, let's, let's look at dependencies, let's look at the, let's say, static analysis with SAMGRAP, if it's, of course, if you are using some kind of uh, free software, and let's look at the dependency, let's say, let's say, let's run OS dependency check, let's build the binary, let's uh, publish it, and let's do the other declarative post actions like uh, some basic test, security test, and so on. Uh, so this is one of the examples how it can be all integrated into one. So running like a, uh, from static, dynamic analysis, dependency checking, and everything that should be done, the basic tests from this one. <coughs> Actually, Luca helped to build this one, yeah. And uh, this is not the end, right? Uh, mostly people write like unit testing, but uh, I didn't see too much security unit testing. Uh, this is something which uh, is still kind of uh, missing parts because uh, for the most, let's say, critical parts in application, it's quite good to actually do the security unit testing and see if it really works by the way you tend it. And mostly, uh, 
the question, the most common question is what should I use for inputs? And these ones are actually quite good uh, sources for uh, having like security inputs for for unit test, of course, besides normal functionality of the application and security functionality of applications. Of course, another thing which is quite good to implement is uh, stuff like truffle hog or dumpster diver, which will automatically detect if you have some kind of credential. Or you can do it as a uh, git hooks, uh, so it will automatically prevent any like a leakage from, from those things. And if you're using like a container security, uh, I found Noi Vector quite good because it's currently open source, so you can actually use it really, really good for all those stuff. And once you have all those things, you, you will see you have like a, a static analysis, interactive uh, security testing, you have uh, dynamic security testing, uh, you have software composition analysis, uh, so you have all those stuff. So how you can know which critical vulnerabilities you have? You actually have to go through all these tools and see them for yourself. It's quite tedious task and, and boring tasks. So uh, I found the Effect Dojo to actually be quite good in actually integrating all those tools into one uh, complete solution so you can actually say, okay, uh, let's feed all those inputs what, which I run, and then uh, I will have a really uh, uh, look at the glance what's actually the problems, right? If I have like a, 10 critical, so I can focus on these 10 criticals and not looking at each tool, what is done. And also I can actually import all those uh, <coughs> things which I've done in manual testing as well, or a penetration test or, or any, anything else. So yeah, it's actually good at summarizing all those things uh, and integrating <coughs> all the information from, from those things. So if I was boring and uh, you want one thing which you want to remember, it's actually this slide, right? So these are all the things I think uh, if you integrate, I think you will be at, let's say, basic level and using mostly free software to integrate. Uh, you, you have a lot of different like uh, static and dynamic analysis tools, but for interactive security testing, you don't have too much choice. You have like don't tie only, let's say, from the open source world. And it can actually help you with Python and Java only. Uh, the problematic part is actually because it uh, <coughs> needs to know the source code and everything, so it's really language <coughs> specific, and that's why it's, it's hard to actually implement so much, so we don't have so much tools. And the other thing which I didn't mention right now is Trivi. It's quite actually interesting because if you're building containers, it, it can detect the vulnerabilities. Uh, what we found out, it's actually quite good at uh, <coughs> identifying components even in binaries. So if you have, for example, Golang binary and you have components inside, for example, I don't know, any other uh, uh, component which is embedded inside the, the Go binary, it will identify all those components inside the Go binary and it will tell you help. So it's, it's actually good uh, compensating control if, for example, dependency checker doesn't work. So it's corrective uh, security measure and it, uh, to implement, uh, to actually detect all those things if something failed in, in, in before. So. I guess uh, this is a uh, good one, of course. There is also other tools, but uh, this is the mostly which I will uh, help you with if you, if you are trying to jump into this world. So do you have any questions? I'm actually finished. It was quite fast. I guess I can talk about each of these tools for, uh, for example, for hours. But we have one question here. I mean, like, question one, thanks for the talk. So how do you handle containers and security vulnerabilities? Let's 
say that you're using Alpine or something like that, and your training comes out with G Link C or something like that, he's wrong more by the way the level five CSS. <laughs> and you've got no other Good question. <laughs> um, I guess I will scream first for two, two minutes, and then uh, let's see the options we have, right? One is actually, let's see if we can upgrade. That's one of the questions, which is kind of hard. Let's see if we can mitigate some, some, uh, somehow, some other way. Uh, since it's glipsy, or let's say muscle, uh, let's see if we can use some other library, right? But then it can break everything, yeah. So it's quite problematic. Uh, the other thing is, of course, let's say some other compensating controls. Uh, one of the compensating controls uh, can be let's not use that function, right? Which is problematic for quite time, but while we not fix it. Uh, there is like a different options, or let's see if we can somehow binary patch it. It depends how, how big it is on what compensating controls we can do. Yeah, I know, it's hard. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you compare from your experience uh, the uh, uh, difference between commercial and open source uh, solutions for uh, dynamic and static uh, analysis? Is there any, is okay. there any, uh, I mean, how do you compare uh, in terms of, of quality and? Uh... Okay, uh, so the question was uh, the comparison between, uh, let's say, static and dynamic analysis tools, uh, open source ones and the commercial ones. For dynamic tests, I would say uh, the open source have quite good uh, features like OSP Zap and so on, and they are actually can be embedded into CI/CD easily. The problem is with static analysis. Uh, static analysis doesn't have good uh, open source tools. That's the problematic part. Um, basically, you are you have some kind of a C like flow finder and so that stuff. You will get a lot of vulnerabilities, and you will just uh, get lost. That's the problem. Uh, with same grep, you will get uh, it's more suitable for CI/CD uh, pipelines, but you are actually limited to language which they like to use, and uh, uh, it's still not like commercial ones. Commercial ones build whole, let's say, abstract syntax tree, and you can query each of the step and so on, and you can write language which can actually query the ancestor of this object and so on and so on. That's not something uh, that currently open source have. That's part of the problem. Uh, hopefully, the will, situation will get much better. SAMGREP, for example, wasn't here like 10 years ago, and now it's at quite good state, and uh, it have like CI/CD. Uh, rules uh, which are quite fast in executing, and they have even audit rules which you can l later use for manual testing. And that's about that. Uh, you have also language specific SAS tools, but they are not at that rate. For example, there, there are tools which can actually tell you commercial ones, you have like 100 vulnerabilities. And the commercial can tell you fix here at that line, and you'll fix all those hundreds. So it can tell you best fixed location, so you don't have to go through each 100. That's not something that open source has currently. So I hope I answered your question. <laughs> uh, any other question? OK, we have one more question. Okay. That's a good question. So the question was uh, where we should start if we are starting with 
if you want to start with cybersecurity. There was one cool guy, which is called Tony Mir. Yeah. And he actually wrote, wrote something called Getting Started in Infosec. And uh, <coughs> here you have uh, things which which are recommended way to actually uh, start see uh, exploring career opportunities and actually technical knowledge which you need to have to actually uh, start serious in, into this field. So I think this is actually one of the good resources here, how you should start. If you're looking from technical point, of course, uh, there's also like from the procedural let's say, uh, governance side, uh, but it's really, security is actually a large field. You, you have like a, from the governance side, uh, management side, uh, social side, it's really have a lo lot of uh, fields to actually ingest and, and benefit from them, right? So, but one of those things, I think it will help you, hopefully. Uh, if you don't find it, uh, find, find Luca or me or I don't know, get hired in some company as a junior and start working, yeah, and see what fits for you, of course. That's another option. Any other question? Uh, we have one minute, so maybe even we don't. Okay, sorry, thank you.